Hello. Um, I woke up early today and was just like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna go right in. Um, I have my tea. I drank my morning shake. I'm going to be talking about the racist foundation of Hollywood and how it continues to be a hub for white supremacy and violent images that cater to um, furthering this conversation of anti-blackness within Hollywood, um, anti-indigeneity within Hollywood, um, and stereotypical violence towards um, non-white individuals um, through the the information that they share. So I have a lot to say. <laughs> um, I, I had done this research about four years ago. I was in a period of um, just retaining and consuming a lot of information, especially around um, Trump's election into office. And that was when I was consuming a lot. And one of the things that I, I researched was the, the foundation, um, the bed that a lot of the studios are built on. So let's go into it. I really have a lot of things to say and I want to be able to speak freely towards the end after I share all of this information. And if you are checking in or coming in, coming out, I will put this up on my IG live so um, that you'll have access to it. And I made a document with just like where my brain was going um, and I'll attach that to um, the live as well just so y'all can follow or be able to follow my brain through this. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that we are currently on stolen land. We are on Tongva and Chumash land. And I really like to focus that and bring attention to that because when we acknowledge that we are on stolen land, we acknowledge that everything built on this land is violent. Um, and that um, sets the our understanding um, as to what systems are in place and who they're affecting. Um, and I do believe in transmutation which for me is the, the, the transformation of spaces um, even when the soil uh, <laughs> is soaked with blood. I, I do believe that um, this earth is capable of that and people are capable of that, but only when there's empathy present, when there's acknowledgement, when there's reparation, and when equity is present, and that's like a minimum, <laughs> and I can go into a deeper conversation, um, and that conversation deserves a lot of depth that I would love to have on another day, but so my name is Jordy Jordan. Jordiana, some people call me Medu or Medulla, only some people, auntie knows who I'm talking about. Um, I have been here in this land um, since I was six years old. 
and been um, involved in the entertainment industry since I was seven and auditioning, um, going to all of the studios that I will um, be, be talking about. Um, a lot of, a lot of my, like, just my beginnings of my creative self and um, exploring creation and performance was informed by um, Hollywood and projects particularly that were being um, created through Hollywood. So I had like about, was it like 15 plus years um, going through that process and experiencing um, the entertainment industry before I was 18. And then I went to um, university for performance for theater. Um, and there was able to expand and also see Hollywood from a different perspective, especially from a, a, a systemic um, perspective, particularly like an institutional perspective. My school, Carnegie Mellon, was very much um, aligned with viewing the the business of of art and the the hubs of art um, as a business, and those hubs being Hollywood, New York, as an extension of Hollywood. Um, in certain ways, especially in theater, it kind of holds its own, <laughs> um, monolithic entity there. But I really was being illuminated to a lot of the, the violence, um, and this was violence through, um, like written literature and what people focus on. Um, white dominated narratives, writers, film, stage work, teachers, um, a good amount of my, my learning was through the lens of whiteness and wasn't really, there wasn't a lot of work being done to expand out of that. In, in a lot of ways, even most of my teachers being white was something um, that is like coming up in my mind. And it was after I graduated that I was really like processing the amount of violence that I experienced as an artist, as a performer um, in what was be becoming, re what was revealed to me, what was being revealed to me um, as a white supremacist um, industry, the entertainment industry, the Hollywood industry that I grew up in that formed and informed my understanding of art, um, even down to the films that I consumed. I, I was a very, and still am a, a largely, um, visual person. I love projecting myself into worlds and um, had access to a lot of films and a lot of movies that informed and shaped who I am and also my relationship with art and my relationship with creation and creativity. And I was doing a lot of healing through that process while also still participating in that process, going to auditions while also understanding and unfurling um, within my own identity as a black, queer, trans being, a non-conforming being who is exploring and expanding, especially more with fashion and still showing up to auditions um, for, for men. Um, <laughs> and 
the stereotypes that come with black men, particularly in Hollywood. And that process, I feel like, expedited and catalyzed my understanding and my relationship of the violence of this industry. Not that I wasn't questioning it before, but now because it was so at opposition, you know, when I started to present in certain ways, my auditions became less and less. Um, when I, you know, walk into a casting director office and I'm, it's my fourth audition, you know, for a, a trans sex worker that has some sort of violence towards their body. Um, I, I realized very quickly how violent that system was, but that is me. And I want to go in specifically on the bed that all of that violence is allowed to rest on. And I have to, I have to do that by focusing on this one particular film. And as we go along, you're going to realize, um, how much rests on this film and how there are deep ties also with <laughs> white terrorist groups and Hollywood that many of our studios and a lot of the projects that come from those studios are built upon. And that film is Birth of a Nation. I don't know if y'all know that film. It is, um, still is one of the highest grossing films in the world. Um, it screened um, it, in about 1915, so roughly a little bit over 100 years ago. Um, it was still um, an epic silent film in that silent film genre. Um, this film brought in close to 50 million to 100 million. I'm pretty sure it grossed that much in 1915. So I'm just like thinking about inflation and like all of that. The numbers aren't here in front of me, but I'm pretty sure that was what I read. It's top five highest grossing films. Um... This film had a lot of nationwide success. It was screened at the White House by President Woodrow Wilson, I believe. Um, it's in the Library of Congress. It was a huge force in um, feature films. Um, it was one of the longest um, silent films of that genre. Um, and really brought in a lot of nationwide support. And this film, um, which was originally called The Klansman, was adapted from a book um, called The Klansman, and it was the romantization of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and this, this film um, was propaganda for the Ku Klux Klan. Um, up until then, the first wave, there are three waves of the Ku Klux Klan um, in different eras. And this happened after the first wave. Um, so there was a kind of resurgence of imagery of black violence, and of stereotypes that paint black people as violent. White people were in blackface, of course. Um, there were multiple artists who were woven into this story. It's also, it's a fictional story, romanticized, romanticized nonfiction. There are characters like Abraham Lincoln and, um, the person who assassinated Abraham Lincoln in it. So it is um, 
like posed as some like historical um, root or historical piece um, that that had a lot of success. So much so that the second wave of the Ku Klux Klan in response to this film um, experienced a resurgence. So about five years after this film was screened, um, we saw the, the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan um, that went from like thousands of members, active members, to about three to six million active members because of the imagery um, and because of um, the nationwide, um, even government support. This film, again, was screened um, at the White House. So there were a lot of people that um, were very much moved by it. In The Birth of a Nation um, and in the book specifically, The Klansman, um, there was imagery of the burning cross, which was not used in the original Klan before. So that image was introduced through this film. Um, as well as the, the, the outfits and the costumes that were used in the film. Um, that was original design that influenced the second wave of, of the clan. <laughs> so we're seeing a direct correlation between like Hollywood's, one of Hollywood's most popular, most successful films influencing white terrorism and the white terrorist group of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, so yes, the refounding in 1915 happened. Um, I'll read a little bit about this. In 1915, the film Birth of a Nation was released. Mythologizing um, and glorifying the first Klan in its endeavors. The second Ku Klux Klan was founded in 1915 by William Joseph Simmons at Stone Mountain. Um, its growth was based on new immigrant, anti-Catholic, prohibitionist, and anti-Semitic agenda which reflected contemporary social tensions, particularly recent immigration. The new organization and chapters adopted regalia featured in The Birth of a Nation. Um, the second clan was a formal fraternal organization with the national and state structure. During the resurgence of the second clan during the 1920s, its publicity was handled by the Southern Publicity Association. Within the first six months of the association's national recruitment campaign, clan membership had increased. Um, and at its peak in mid-1920s, the organization claimed to include about 15% of the nation's eligible population, a good majority of them in Indiana. Bless any Black people in Indiana. Um, so... I want to talk a little bit about the director, D.W. Griffith, who was the son of a Confederate army soldier um, and also one of the 36 original founders of the Academy Awards. So this, <clears throat> this person who unapologetically uses blackface and violence towards black bodies um, and basically creates N national support of this this white supremacist propaganda um, is at the 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 foundation of the Academy Awards as well as the United Artists Corporation UA. It's currently doing business as United Artists Digital Studios. Um, this person, um, D. W. Griffith, that director was in um, 
uh, a really uh, symbiotic relationship with Charlie Chaplin, um, who also um, was one of the founders of the UA as well, which is a studio that was premised on allowing actors to control their own interests rather than um, being dependent upon commercial studios. Um, the bed of movies like um, especially Black-centered movies like Creed II and If Beale Street Could Talk um, rest on the foundation of um, the UA. How this person died, I just want to uplift that. On the morning of July 23rd, Griffith was discovered unconscious in the lobby at the Knickerbocker Hotel in Los Angeles where he had been living alone. He died of a cerebral hemorrhage at 3.42 p.m. on the way to Hollywood Hospital. A public memorial service was held in his honor at the Hollywood Masonic Temple, but few stars came to pay their last respects. He is buried at Mount Tabor Methodist Church in Kentucky, where I believe he was born. In 1950, the Directors Guild of America provided a stone and bronze monument for his gravesite. I want to talk about the aftermath of someone like this um, who is celebrated for creating white supremacist propaganda, who is one of the founders of the Academy Awards and one of the founders of the UA. And he... Also, and during this time, the NAACP was like, what the fuck are y'all doing? Like, they were like, no, why are you watching these things? Like, why is this being screened at the, the White House? There were massive protests in Boston and still white people came out in droves to watch and support this film, Birth of a Nation. And he was not apologetic for it. He was very much a white supremacist who, whose name, whose image, and whose work reflects this relationship between film and anti-blackness, film and racism, film and violence, actual violence. The KKK was not burning crosses before this film came out. And directors like Hitchcock, Kubrick, Victor Fleming, who, who directed The Wizard of Oz, and Charlie Chaplin, his deepest, most intimate confidant, praised his work. Charlie Chaplin called him the teacher of us all. In 1953, the Directors Guild of America instituted the D.W. Griffith Award, its highest honor. However, on December 15th in 1999, the DGA president, Jack Shea, and the DGA National Board announced that the award would be renamed as the DGA Lifetime Achievement Award. They stated that although Griffith was extremely talented, they felt his film, The Birth of a Nation, had helped foster intolerable racial stereotypes and that it was thus better not to have the top award in his name. This was in 1999, roughly 40 years after the Directors Guild actually put this award in his name. In 1975, Griffith was honored on a 10 cent posted stamp by the United States. D.W. Griffith Middle School in Los Angeles is named after Griffith because of the association of Griffith and the racist nature of the birth of a nation. Attempts have been made to rename the 99% minority enrolled school. His walk a fame star, the star on the Walk of Fame is at 6535 Hollywood Boulevard, ironically right next to the black jazz singer Duke Ellington. We're seeing national support of an overt 
racist and white supremacist who is at the core of the Academy Awards, the UA, who is seen as the father of the industrialization of cinema. Birth of a Nation was one of the largest silent movie films, um, especially pre-Depression era. It was seen as a marker for this golden era of Hollywood. Um, I think the close-up was used in this film. There were a lot of techniques that directors really pulled from um, as images of white people in blackface um, ripping the clothes off of young white women exacerbated this relationship, this circulation of, of violence and painting Black people as violent, particularly. Um, the writer of the film, um, who is Jeremy Dixon Jr., I, nothing really stood out much other than that he was really, really racist and went to Johns Hopkins University. Um, referred to as a professional racist. <laughs> he wrote the book that um, not only influenced the burning of crosses by the Ku Klux Klan and their actual attire during the second wave, but, you know, just violence and propaganda. Um, yeah, he had uncles and family in the first wave of the Ku Klux Klan. So he, um, he had deep ties with um, the Ku Klux Klan. And it was because of those ties that allowed him to write the book, The Klansman, that was then adapted to one of the highest grossing films, The Birth of a Nation. Um, so there is an actor in the film that was also one of the 36 original founders of the Academy Awards. One of the co-writers of this film was also one of the 36 original founders of the Academy Awards. Um, I didn't go deep, deep, but there are at least four out of 36 members of the original um, Academy Awards, uh, Academy Award members that have direct ties with the birth of a nation, um, which show you what the bed of the Academy Awards is resting on. Um, before I go into the Academy Awards, I want to uplift the producers of the film, the Aitken brothers, who are these, um, studio heads, these brothers, I think from Wisconsin. And they, after the, the film's success, massive success, they had lots of money and they started to buy different studios around the, the, Stolen Land, Los Angeles, Hollywood area. And those studios ended up like um, being absorbed by uh, big names like Paramount. Um, in Culver City, the Sony Pictures Studios um, were a hub for them creating art and, and work. Um, there is a relationship with Beings who, in response to the money that they received from this film, Birth of a Nation, and buying land and monopolizing land and resources through studios and their studio support and the, the leading, leading and pioneering the industry because of their access to the, the funds received from this racist, white supremacist propaganda. They ended up pioneering the industrialization of the film industry that went on long through the golden era of Hollywood. And that particular, it was called Studio something. I like had it in my notes and then completely like deleted it and couldn't find it again. Um, I found it by looking up their studio. It's called Tri or Triangle Studio. It was a studio between the Aiken brothers and I think D.W. Griffith also worked with them. And it, it's a particular 
method of that studios were implementing through the golden era of Hollywood that allowed for distribution as well as like um, marketing um, and production all in one place. So it was like a industrialization hub. They were able to make thousands of films that way and get them out so quickly um, that allowed them to monopolize the market. It was like, you know how Netflix like just creates so much that something might stick and by creating so much, it creates a hub around itself that anyone could be able to like pick and choose what they get. They were like doing that, creating content, creating content. One will pick and it will bring them money. And if it doesn't, you know, like it doesn't. And that actually became like, I don't know, abolished or amended in the 1950s by the state because of how successful it was um, at monopolizing um, the resources and monopolizing the platforms that a lot of this art would be shared through. So the Aitken brothers, who were the producers of this film, were the pioneers of that kind of Hollywood mentality, um, that business Hollywood mentality that informed the golden era and allowed for the monopolization of, resor of, of resources, of land, um, and of platforms particularly to still be enacted today. There are about a handful of five studios, conglomerate studios, that other studios are under. It may say a Netflix project, but what lot was it shot on? Okay, so we're going to go into the Academy I can't even go into how deep the Academy Awards is um, and the relationship between the birth of a nation, this racist, white supremacist propaganda, and the foundation of Hollywood and the, the pinnacle of success being um, found within the Academy Awards as well. Four out of the 36 original founders had direct ties to this film, Birth of a Nation, which featured overt white supremacist propaganda, white people in blackface, those black people seen as violent and, and savage enacting violence towards white bodies, white women particularly. I remember seeing this image when I was like 13, 14, maybe 15 in like history class, but we didn't go into it, into it, you know? They like skated on the side of it or on the top of it. But I remember this image of, of seeing this white person in blackface, like ripping the clothes off of this white woman in like old silent Hollywood era film style and multiple founders have created films so outside outside of the people who were direct like tied directly to the birth of a nation that has direct ties to the resurgence of the second wave of the Ku Klux Klan by millions of members outside of that people were making Films rooted in overt racism towards black people, towards Native American people. Some films go as far to contain racial slurs that I don't even want to share. And a good amount contain blackface and, and redface. And I'm curious about the use of that word because I don't even know if people, Native American people particularly, even identify as red. So I'm curious if there's any way other way to say what they're doing. <sighs> and that was the Academy. The basis of the Academy. And a large amount of these people, all of them look white. All of them have white skin. 
and a good amount of these people are of Russian and Jewish descent. Which is so interesting to me because a, a huge aspect of the KKK is anti-Jewish, anti, anti-Semitic, anti, even anti-Catholic. It's very white, Protestant, non-immigrant, like terrorism. They are not still living, but you know... White people have babies who have babies. And I'm like, if y'all aren't addressing the the issue and, and, and the violence perpetuated by your family members, what are you doing but continuing a cycle of violence? I want to illuminate the benefit of assimilation due to skin color into the homogeny of whiteness or this like grouping of whiteness, but more importantly, further dis distancing themselves from blackness, aided by, aided by exacerbated racist content that further feeds white supremacy. So the word complacency comes to mind. It's interesting because the the bigger their threat is, and I'm talking about the the KKK, the bigger their threat is, and the the more content that can be made that separates black black people and blackness from white people and whiteness, the the larger that the 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 focus and the larger threat of the KKK becomes black people and and separates and allows for Jewish folks, Catholic folks to be the lesser of the two. Therefore, allowing for, you know, violence to be perpetuated towards the black body. So a lot of these these Jewish folks who created and were at the bed of um, the academy whose identity is very much not supported and also attacked by white terrorist groups like the KKK, you would think, you would think that propaganda that allows for the resurgence of the KKK would be stopped by Jewish folks with power, with resources, but that wasn't the case because this propaganda was also anti-black and perpetuating violence towards the black body. And that was something that these Jewish people did not have and therefore they were able to be remain complacent because there was a a larger a larger threat towards the KKK which was the black body and blackness particularly yes so yeah even though KKK ideologies are known especially for anti catholic and anti jewish roots they are able to be protected by further focusing on the racial divide. A good amount of these, these Jewish folks at the, the core of the foundation of the Academy Awards of Hollywood allowed for multiple films to be made that were anti-Black and violent towards the Black body because, because of this monolith of whiteness that they were able to benefit from, which is very disconcerting because of how violent the Ku Klux Klan also is towards Jewish people. And the, the pull from violence and, and Nazi Germany that Ku Klux Klan people are aligned with. 
And one of the tools and ways that they're able to do that is um, and was was and is through um, blackface. So through the 1930s, many well-known entertainment entertainers of stage and screen also performed in blackface. Some of your faves like Bing Crosby, Fred Astaire, Joan Crawford, Doris Day, Betty Grable, Laurel and Hardy, The Three Stooges, Mickey Rooney, who loved to be in in all kinds of different people's faces. Um, Shirley Temple, your fave. Animal crackers in her racist soup. And uh, 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 a, a white gay's favorite, Judy Garland, darling. <laughs> all of these people benefited from anti-blackness through the use of blackface further further perpetuating and circulating the image of of violence there were people i was doing research there were people who were like cool with black people cool you know who were like yes yes we should do an all black face like production yes Yes, we should. This was the bed of Hollywood. And I couldn't even go into the the studios that allowed this to happen. There was a documentary I watched like four years ago. And it it's just like studios that people do like um, tours at. You know, Warner Brothers, you're going on the Paramount lot. And to see the amount of, of even Westerns that were, you know, portraying Native Americans by, like, white people, exacerbating stereotypes of non-white racial groups. All of that funded, funded monetary funds to allow for these studios to build. And when I talked earlier about, about what transmutation I believe can be possible on land that has experienced a lot of violence. There has to be a conversation of reparation. What are you doing when you have profited, profited largely by producing content that is white supremacist and and specifically violent. I I want to, you know, stop centering white supremacy as much as I center white violence and white terrorism. These images led to millions of black people being killed. Like and and honestly like other folks as well, you know? Violence. So much violence. But the profit, and that was from Hollywood. One of the quotes that was very interesting was from Disney, particularly about the song of the South. Um, and the Disney boss, Bob Igar, offered an explanation for the company's unwillingness to show or sell the song of the South, which uh, the song Zippity Doo Dah, if you've ever heard it, it was on Disney sing alongs. I watched it when I was quite young. Um, we all know that song. This song was sung, um, by someone who was black and narrated to be an enslaved person. There were cotton fields, I think, behind them. And this black person is singing zippity doo dah to these white children. This boss in 2011 said, it wouldn't necessarily sit right or feel right to a number of people today, he said. And it wouldn't be in the best interest of our shareholders to bring it back. Even though there would be some financial gain. And that sentence just really illuminates for me the relationship that white Hollywood has towards racist and anti-black violent propaganda. That because it's not trendy, because 
We're not necessarily hanging black people by trees in troves in, in large amounts anymore. I guess now we shouldn't really do it because uh, it wouldn't be in the best interest of our shareholders. And my thing is like, look at the shareholders and see the demographic. So if it's not benefiting rich white people to be racist anymore, <laughs> overtly, then we're not going to do it. This was in 2011. This was the, the boss of Disney. And um, this conversation was also around Disney Plus and their decision to maybe uh, amend some of the scenes in Disney films like um, the original Fantasia that uh, uh, focused on a scene between all of these white centaurs and then a black centaur um, having the body of a donkey catering to them as well as Dumbo um, and the crows, the jive talking um, black crows in that as well. This, this conversation happened around Disney Plus within the past year or so about amending these films and putting them on the screening platform, but they chose not to. They chose to put them on the platform and also have a, a disclaimer in the beginning of it. Because at the end of the day, everybody loves to see a big ass gray elephant flying with their ears. And doesn't mind listening to some jive talking black crows named Jim. Most of the recent blackface benders that I have been shell shocked through. One I did not see and... Just thought, I just thought Angelina Jolie was really tan in this movie. I don't know if y'all saw A Mighty Heart, but it's based on an Ethiopian woman. I believe she's Ethiopian. She's very black. If you look up a picture of her, she is black. But Angelina Jolie was just like, I really, really want to be her. I really just like, I just really want to tell her story. You know, girl boss, girl boss. Um, and she did. I think it, I think, I want to say, I'm going to look it up right now. I want to say she directed that film as well. And that was also one of the reasons why did she direct it? It was produced by Brad Pitt. Um, I'm trying to see who directed this film because I want to say, oh no. It was directed by Michael Winterbottom. Hence the last name. He's very white. Um, and Brad Pitt produced it. Ugh. <laughs> um, but yeah. So there is a relationship between violence towards black people. Monopolizing black narratives excuse me, narratives that white people actually are like, let's produce this. Let's make this film about this black person. Let's make this film that centers this black person. But get Angelina Jolie because, you know, we don't want no black actress. What? We want to make money. We want to make money. And I don't know how much Mighty Heart grossed, but I'm sure, okay, it earn, only earning a total revenue of 18 million compared to its production budget, 16 million. Uh, they only got like 2 million. It grossed in Canada. I don't know. It was released, y'all. Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 79%. You know? Um, and then the second one, and this was the shell shock I was talking about, was it was Tropic Thunder. And that came out quite recently, within the past 15 years, 10 years or so. I remember, I remember watching that film. I, I don't even know if I watched it in the theaters. I probably did. I watched it with non-black friends. We're all laughing. They're laughing. We're, you know? Ben Stiller. 
Robert Downey Jr. In blackface, very much as a black person. Um, and and it's, it's the gag, you know? It's for the gag. Um, and it's to further the story. But what gets me about that particular case is the fact that the Academy chose to nominate Robert Downey Jr. for an Academy Award for that performance. I think that's what gets me the most out of it is the national support of the violence towards Black people, the amount of money that it can bring in, and how entertaining it can be. This is to say the homogeny of whiteness, the collection of all things white, white dominated narratives in front of the screen and off of the screen, writers, directors, films, TV, by continuing to exacerbate that, that cycle, by monopolizing land, tools like, um, like cameras, equipment, resources, able to get the highest in because of the money that this violence brought in, like Birth of a Nation, that brought in 50 to $100 million dollars. Like all of these other films in the early golden era of Hollywood that that relied heavily on blackface and the use of racial stereotypes of black people, of Native American people, of Asian people. And giving birth to conglomerates like the big five, Walt Disney Studios, Warner Brothers, Universal Pictures, Columbia, Paramount, all of these dominant, massive studios, they're huge. I don't know if you've been there, but they are huge. They are monopolizing land. There is so much land that is empty. They're lots and they are glamorized storage lots for real, for real. There are old sets, old sets that had blackface artists on, narratives of black violence and Native American violence are on these Western old outdated sets that are still up. Burn them. Recycle them to the earth. They are collecting and holding on to an era that was the basis and foundation for their power and their control in a white supremacist industry like Hollywood, which is one reason they're holding on to it. And the monopolization of resources allows for anybody else to not have access unless they hand them the key, unless they sign the deal. Beyonce just signed a deal, I think for a hundred million dollars or something with Walt Disney. I'm curious how that will manifest. I kind of rolled my eyes at it because there's talks of a Black Panther 2, which Black Panther 1, as beautiful as it was and as thankful as I am for the the visibility that it allowed for black creatives, specifically the black femmes that won um, Academy Awards for their creative direction and artistic um, hands in that world particularly. But it is paradoxical because that film also is in um, direct support of, of the CIA 
and the FBI. There is a white savior in there, y'all, who works for the state. But then you have the movie opening centering actual um, political organizations and activists like the Black Panthers who were targeted directly by the CIA. Make it make sense. Make it make sense. And it doesn't or it does given the racist bed that all of these projects are allowed to suck nutrients from. In academic usage, white supremacy, particularly in usage with which draws on critical race theory or intersectionality, the term white supremacy can also refer to a political or socioeconomic system in which white people enjoy a structural advantage or privilege over other ethnic groups on both a collective and individual level. When we talk about structure, we have to talk about foundation. And that's why this, this talk, this exploration of Hollywood's race, racist foundations that allows it to continually be the hub for white supremacy is what I wanted to focus on today. The root, the origin. I saw all of those white artists saying, I take responsibility. I take responsibility. Do you take responsibility and make a pledge to never work in Hollywood again? Do you take responsibility and and take a pledge to never um, to 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 pledge to be the token white person in the project? If the cast is only white people, do you take the pledge to pull out and convince all of your white friends to pull out as well and have them um, recast? Do you take the pledge? Do you take the pledge, millionaire, white, Hollywood, elite person, to, to retire and donate half of your, your net worth to black trans people individually? Do you take that pledge? I don't even mind if white people are... Producing things. I, I, I roll my eyes, but I'm like, if you got money, use it. And even then, I'm like, ugh. Queen and Slim had a, 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 a white male producer who also is credited as um, the, the, the story, uh, the creator of the story. Be, simply because he was at a party with Lena Waithe and said, let me talk to you. Let me talk to you. You know, like imagine Bonnie and Clyde. Imagine, imagine Bonnie and Clyde, but make them black. Police brutality, right? But I can't write it, you know, cause like, you know, I can't write it, but you can. Let me fund it. Credit me. Let me fund it. We'll make a lot of money. You know, it's a hot issue right now. It's hot. Hot off the press. I'll fund it. You be the face. You be the black face. You be the black queer face. And get all your people. Get all your people. It'll be hot. Hot off the press. I'll cut the check. And this person, ironically, was kicked off of um, Oprah's book list, Oprah's like top book list for fabricating um, autobiographies or a memoir um, about his life. <laughs> he gets away with so much and is able to produce and able to make films and projects that are very stereotypically that are are a, a seen as a pinnacle for for black art no one showed his face because he didn't have to show it he had a black face to use 
So I say white producers, but I also roll my eyes because I'm just so fucking tired. I just want white people to give their money away because Hollywood is trash. But I have hope and I only have five seconds. <laughs> so I'll put this up. Thanks for 